grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Uh, so I had a difficult time this week choosing what text I wanted to focus on. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be the epistle because I had just worked through uh, John's epistle in Lent. And so I was, you know, weighing my options between this Old Testament text that talks about this foundational character uh, called Abram there, but we know him uh, more fully as Abraham. Uh, and then this, this other wonderful little parable. And so I'm, I'm doing study on both, and I'm trying to work through both, and, and nothing is jumping out of it. So eventually I've just got to do what we all have to do, and then just make a choice. Right? You just got to kind of make a decision. Um, and, and it's very rare in life that we don't have to make a decision. It can be uh, a big decision. It can be a little decision, right? What time am I going to go to bed? What am I going to eat? So on and so forth. A bigger decision, sure, like I said. But every day we are faced with a multiplicity of decisions, actions we have to take, right? And there are certain things that guide us through some of those. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we just kind of make a choice because you've got to make a choice and, and you move on. Uh, so I bet you're all wondering which text did I choose? And the answer is both. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the gospel text, right? Uh, this, this familiar parable, and I do believe it's a parable. I don't believe this is a true story uh, in the sense of this kind of actually happened. Uh, but I believe Jesus is telling this parable. We can talk more about it after the service if you're interested. Um, he's telling this parable to the Pharisees, right? Uh, the, the, the first part of chapter 16 Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about money. He's talking to them about divorce. And then he tells this parable about this guy who is a rich man, right? He's got fine linens. He feasts sumptuously. Uh, he's got sort of every advantage in the world. And his exact opposite is this guy named Lazarus, who has nothing, right? I mean, he is laid at the guy's front gate. It doesn't even say he walked himself in. He is laid at this man's gate hoping to get some of the crumbs that fall. But he doesn't even get those, right? No, he gets these unclean dogs that come and lick the sores all over his body. What kind of um, comfort or security or safety is that? And both of them end up dying, right? Uh, and and the, the, the story goes that uh, Lazarus gets taken up to, to be with Abraham in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man goes into Hades and is in torment. And he sees Abraham, he sees Lazarus, and he calls out, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to cool my tongue, right? Because I am in torment. And Abraham's like, sorry, you can't do it. Um, it's not going to happen. I can't send him there. I can't. There's this chasm. Sorry, it's not going to work. And so the guy says, okay, fine. Right? Send him back to tell my brothers so that they don't end up where I am. And he's not. Nah, can't do that either. They've got Moses and the prophets. They, they should be okay. And the guy's like, no, they need somebody to come back to rise from the dead. And then Abraham's last words are, if they have Moses and the prophets and they don't believe him, neither will they believe if someone were to rise from the dead. And the parable ends. Now, um, this, this parable, right, it, it has quite a bit to say about the decisions this rich guy made with his money. Okay? He had every advantage in the world. He had uh, everything he could want for, want for and then some. Right? But he does not use them to care for his neighbor. And conceivably, that's why he ends up in torment. Um, because he is not actually doing the kinds of things he should be doing. Lazarus, on the other hand, he's got nothing. Um, he's got nothing in this life, and so he kind of gets it in the end. And I want to put a pin in this for a second. Because we've got to talk about the other guy in the parable, who's talked about in our Old Testament text. This guy named Abram, uh, that we know more fully as Abraham, like I said. And, and in Genesis 15, right, um, Abraham has already been called at this point. Right? That happened back in chapter 12. God saw this man and said, hey, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you, so on and so forth. And Abraham says, all right, let's go do this, right? And you think, okay, here's this great pillar of faith, right? This guy is going to be a wonderful example only right after he believes God in chapter 12, he's walking into Egypt, and he says, uh, I don't want Pharaoh to take my life. So, hey, Sarah, pretend to be my sister. I mean, that's, like, not a good thing, right? Uh, and, and Abraham has these moments where uh, he's probably less than ideal in terms of how he acts. But in, in, in chapter 15 here, right, 
he is um, kind of beside himself because he's getting old and he still doesn't have his own child to be his heir. Someone else from his house is going to be his heir. And yet God speaks to him and reminds him of the promise he made. And Abraham believes God and it's credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. I'd like to tell you that everything Abraham does after chapter 15 is wonderful and very good. But you need to read the text and find out. Um, not everything he does is great and wonderful and good, despite the fact that he believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness. Abraham is a pillar of faith, right? I mean, he's, he's this guy uh, who, who had, eventually has the, the, the son named Isaac, right? He has a son named Jacob, and so on and so forth. And when Moses, right, is going to go back and bring the Israelites out of Egypt, who's, the, who's, the, who's this guy, right? You just tell them that it's the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham is integral to the story of God's Old Testament people, right? And part of it is because of this belief that gets credited to him as righteousness, this trust in God that God is going to carry out what he says he's going to do. doesn't always mean he lives it out, but he certainly has that foundation. So let's go back to the parable. What's the difference between this rich man and Lazarus? Well, it seems to me that Lazarus is a lot more like Abraham than the rich man is. Now, people always ask, well, why is it that Lazarus gets a name and the rich man doesn't? They don't think it's because it's a real story. I think it's because of what the name Lazarus means. It's a clue. Lazarus means God is my help. In other words, the only thing this poor man had to rely on was God himself. The rich man had all these other sorts of things to rely on. His goods, his clothing, his riches, his finances, his food. He has every advantage in the world. But the only thing Lazarus has is God. And you see the difference between the two in how they act on earth. It doesn't say Lazarus complains. It doesn't say he gets ticked off because the dogs are licking his sores. No, he just lives his life the way it is from that foundation of trust in God, knowing that God is his help. The rich man doesn't live by that way. He lives in terms of what he wants, what he's going to do. He doesn't care about a little poor guy on the side. If you ever want a sobering read, go find Luther's sermon on this parable. Uh, you would call him a communist. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. Because he just has line after line against unrestrained capitalism. And, I mean, he just goes off on how so many times in our lives we don't actually live from the reality that God is taking care of us, which means we can go take care of others. And that's the point of the parable. That's actually what Jesus is calling the Pharisees out for. He's calling them out for not caring for God's people, for not caring for the poor. As much as that line about rising from the dead is a comment about believing in Christ and who he says he is as God's own son, it's also a comment on believing what the prophets had said about how you take care of the poor. And it's all over the prophets about how you need to care for the poor and the destitute and, and, and the, the stranger in your midst. And if you're not doing that, you've got to ask yourself, why? What is it about my beliefs that are translating into my actions? Lazarus, belief meant trust, regardless of what came down the pipe. For Abraham, a lot of the time, belief meant trust. That God was going to carry it out. Now sometimes he flubs, right? And we get an Ishmael because of it. But sometimes his belief looks like the mere sacrifice of Isaac. Where he takes the only son that God has given him, treks out with him, and is about to sacrifice him simply because God told him to do it. That's trust you and I can't comprehend sometimes. Decisions flow from our belief whether we want to admit that or not. The way we act toward one another, the way we care for or don't care for one another, not just in this room, but outside it, 
flows from how we understand what God in Christ has done for us. Part of the reason we read texts every week in church is not just to give some sort of tidbit of information, right? Not just because, okay, well, we need to get this little bit from Genesis and this little bit from Luke, and we need to get a refresher. No, it's because God himself, the one who is telling the parable in Luke, Christ himself, he is alive in this text. He lives and breathes through the words on the page. He comes to form and shape us in his likeness, in his image, by reminding us of who we are because of what he has done for us, that we might go out and live in light of that reality. This is not, I've got to do good so I get to the good place in the end. This is a, I know who I am. I have been bought and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, which means I get to go live the kind of life he lived, a life in service to others. See, the, the heir, right, that Abraham has promised, yes, he gets Isaac. But Matthew and Luke make it very clear that the real heir God is talking about here, it's not Isaac. It's not Jacob. No, it's the one who comes through that line. It's Christ himself. He is the one through whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. He is the one into whom you and I have been brought through the waters of baptism, which are not only a forgiveness of sin, which are not only a washing away of all that is problematic in us. It is also a marching orders, if you will, to play around in that baptismal water and take that life back out into a world where selfishness tends to rule and reign. When we come to the table, we don't merely feast on Christ, though we do that. We are empowered with his very life that we might go outside these walls and care for the beggars at our own age. The life we have in faith is never only just for us. And it's never only just for us in this room. Having the right belief should lead to the right kinds of actions. It should translate into us not acting like the rich man, but acting more like Lazarus who understands that our only help is God himself. But that's okay. Because God himself has given us everything we need for this body and life that we might go out and care for others. Who we are in Christ determines how we should live it. And like Abraham, we're going to make mistakes. Like anyone, we're going to make mistakes. But those mistakes do not define us. They are not what shapes and forms our identity. It is Christ himself whose sacrificial death on the cross paid for those mistakes and all the other ones we've yet to make, who rose again on Easter morning that sin and death might not rule over you anymore, but that his own life, given to you in the waters of baptism, his own life that you taste at the rail might be the controlling thing in your life. That it may spur you on to love and care for those who you don't even know their name right now. For those who you may not like. For those with whom you may disagree vehemently on some things. Our actions are not dictated and determined by our sinful nature. They should not be. They should be dictated and determined by the one who is the true heir promised to Abraham. By the one who is speaking these words to the Pharisee. By the one who comes and lives and dies and rises again, not for his own sake, but for yours. And who gives that life to you, that you and I might give that life to others.